Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of FBW Livestream. Today, we are so happy to have Manisha Siwal, the CMO of Caro Group with us. And we are going to talk about the Netflix of cars and why is this the transport, uh, the future of transport in Asia. If you want more business insights uh, from experts in this field and stay up to date of the latest business developments, please do feel free to sign up for our free membership right here in the link below. As a member, you will have access to exclusive offers, collaboration opportunities, and complimentary business advice. And as always, if you have questions during the live stream, please feel free to ask them in the comments below. Right, Anisha, before we start off, we do have a dial-in today. Uh, I believe it's from Ifan, who has a question for you. Can we please wow. have you on the line, please? Sure. Okay, I think we have a little bit of a technical uh, problem right here. So let's, uh, maybe we'll, we'll get uh, Yifan to come back in a bit. Now, okay. Manisha, let's, uh, I have a lot of questions for you today, actually. So first <laughs> of all, uh, congratulations to Caro on securing another $150 million worth of debt financing and equity. So um, just to start off, for, for those who are not so familiar with Caro, could you explain what it does? And why is this system called the Netflix for Cars? Okay, so let me talk a little bit about Caro first. So Caro mm -hmm. is a Singapore-based startup. We are about five years old now. Uh, and uh, we're already in four countries, so Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia. Uh, and we, even though we are just five years old, we are already Southeast Asia's largest car marketplace. So what this means is anything to do with a car, whether you want to sell a car, sell your car, you want to buy a car, a new car, a used car, you want to lease a car, you want to get financing for your car, you want to get insurance for your car, or you want to fix your car in a workshop. We have sort of everything covered end to end. Uh, and that's that's pretty much what Caro is. And to your next question about the Netflix of cars, the so Netflix of cars is is one of the product lines that we have, uh, where mm -hmm. we allow. Uh, so because you realize that millennials, expats, they love to subscribe to cars rather than actually car ownership. So there was a there was a genuine need where people wanted a bit more agility and flexibility and, and owning a car but without the financial burden. So we launched this product and we called it the Netflix for cars because you could change a car every, uh, say, six months. It's just like as if you're changing movies and you pay the one flat fee uh, as if you're subscribing to a car. So the concept was marketed as like a Netflix for cars and you pay everything online end to end and you pay through your credit card. Well, it's very interesting, uh, the ability to subscribe to a car uh, just as easy as how we like to subscribe to tv channels now yeah. how do you think the the ownership of cars has evolved over the the, the past five years yeah so i when i saw the question i think it's very interesting mm -hmm. right so initially we saw that so five years is a long time five years is when the company was not barely even around so there was there were so i would say you know, shared mobility like your Uber, Grab, and let's talk about Asia was so barely there. So people mm -hmm. were going in the traditional way, you know, buying and selling cars, the brick and mortar way. The whole experience was not really digitized. And the way the way this was happening was the way I think our parents bought cars back right. in the yeah, you, you go to a showroom, you test drive, and you make a down payment, uh, either with a checkbook or whatever, uh, or even interbank gyro is fine. But it was nothing was digitized. So things were going as per normal. And then we saw the boom of shared mobility. So we had the likes of Uber and then Grab, Gojek, and then Grab ended up, you know, uh, Uber ended up being uh, uh, taken over, say, by Grab, at least in this part of the world. And we saw a huge increase in shared mobility going up and the whole digital, I would say, mobile savviness uh, of people mm -hmm. in Asia just exploded with smartphone uh, adaptability, with uh, with uh, internet uh, penetration going up. It was just, it was, I would say the timing was right because a lot of times this such new concepts are about product market fit and market readiness. 
So, so we saw this huge spike where people went for shared mobility and then COVID happened uh, early this year. And then we saw people moving away from shared mobility uh, mm -hmm. and own their cars again, if not just subscribe to a car, which is at least their own personal space. Right. Uh, uh, as far as, you know, keeping their families uh, safe is concerned. So I would say it's been sort of a wave. So it went up and then it came down and then it's sort of going up again. So that's where we had. Right. Okay. Uh, let's hold on to uh, discussing uh, Carol for, for now because uh, sure. Ifan is back uh, online. Uh, can we have okay. uh, Ifan, please? Nice. Hi, Ifan. Hello, can you hear me? I can't hear you, my dear. Hello? Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes, Ifan. Hi. All right. Um, hi, very nice to meet you. Um, how's your day so far? <laughs> uh, great day. How about you? I'm, I'm good. Um, I'm calling from California. <laughs> so very glad to, to join this. Uh, oh, wow. What time is it there? Um, right now it's 8 p.m. So it's perfect timing. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. I'm very glad to hear your sharing and then specifically very, in, I'm working in a startup. Um, I'm actually having one question, um, sure. specifically for, you know, female leadership, um, how do you encounter with the, some of the gender stereotype and how do you balance the assertive versus, you know, being bossy when at work place? <laughs> I love that question because, uh, I sort of live that question almost every day. <laughs> so, so, well, how do you do it? Honestly, I, I think, I, can't, I would say we can't change the world overnight, right? All these biases have been there for, for years and years, and it's, it's formed such layers that it's not going to go away so quickly. So I told myself, Manisha, you have two options. Option one is you get very jaded by these biases and that will affect my performance or mm. you take it a bit in your stride, but whenever the timing is right, you try to correct people a little bit and hopefully they get the, get, get the idea. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in my first, first year, so I, would, I wouldn't even call it appraisal, first year performance chat, right, that I had uh, with my boss and uh, asked him, how do you think I'm doing? How, uh, you know, is everything okay? Are things on track? And uh, the, the first feedback he gave me, Manisha, you're a little bit bossy. <laughs> and uh, and in, my, in my mind, the immediate trigger that I got, oh, he actually means you have great leadership skills. Mm -hmm. so, don't, so I had to sort of manage it myself. And my, my emotions at that time was like, what? So I asked him, okay, so do you want me to be less bossy? And then he said, no, 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 that's not what I meant. What I meant is, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you Try to be a bit nicer if you can. Then I say, but then things don't get done. Is that what you want? And then uh, I said, no, no, no. I don't think I mean that. Of course, uh, I mean, uh, find a way, find a way. See, you know, everybody can get along and stuff. So, so my point is, things are not going to change. Mm -hmm. Things, biases will come, but you have to, first of all, teach yourself how to handle it and give enough triggers so that people on the other side get it. But at the same time, you don't break relationships. Mm. because at the end of the day you are one team you need to work as a team so like in whatsapp chat group that i'm in uh, i'm the only only female there and suddenly i would get a message like hey gents uh, can i get an update on this and i actually said haha not all are gents <laughs> right, so you have to take it with a you have to you have to make a little bit of humor out of it because you should always keep the team first before the gender but at the same time find the right timing to show that, hey, this is not very cool, guys. Come on. So that's at least how I handle it. Because if I if I take it too heavily, it's going to affect my performance. And I would not be a team player, which to me is not acceptable. Does that help answer the question? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, yeah, sometimes one comes into the tech industry, 
a lot of guys and then certain meetings only for me is only one female in the meeting there was yeah. time I would feel a little bit intimidating uh, but I I was always receiving the feedback like my boss said you need to be less nicer you have to be mm. more yeah. assertive in a way <laughs> so, you, for me I think I'm not as nice I was asked to be nicer you are too nice so what I would suggest is uh, consciously in meetings, try not to take notes, try to listen and speak up uh, when there's a discussion going on. So I think as we write, we are just wired to start writing down things, which sometimes comes across as we are being very passive. They're not really involved in the discussion. These are small little things, but they go a long way. And when you sit, try to always sit at the table. Don't sit at the behind, don't pull a chair on the corner, own your space and speak up. Yeah? So Thank you. Yeah, I hope that helps. And be as structured as possible when you speak. Uh, that also helps. Okay, thank you so much. This is very helpful. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much, Manisha. You know, as you were talking about try not to take notes, I was doing exactly that. I was taking <laughs> notes of what you have said. <laughs> That's okay. This is different. It's a girly gang fight. <laughs> anyway, um, I really like the tips you share. So, uh, you know, try not to take notes uh, and uh, listen to the conversation as well as, you know, sit at the table. Don't pull a chair. Corner yourself yeah. to make your presence known. And of course, to keep a very structured, uh, uh, have a very structured uh, train of thought and, and conversation. So really love those tips. Now, we will come back to uh, the topic of female leadership in, in a bit, guys, uh, because let me just, let's just go back, okay? Let's spend some time talking about Cairo and, and transport. We will we will leave a, a later section to uh, talking about female leadership. Now, so where we left off just now, you were talking about uh, the, uh, you know, how the, the demand for shared mo mobility has, was like a, a, a u-shaped curve right so it, it went up because of uh, shared mobility then it came down because of covid and all, all these um hygiene uh, sort of safety concerns now, where do you see this trend uh going forward so going forward right we are seeing more uh, a big trend of people wanting to have subscribed to a car so back to mm -hmm. the product and fix for cars and they like it because there is no down payment uh like compared to buying a used car or buying a new car. Plus, it doesn't eat into your finances. So your salary, you know, you can, it's not, you're not heavily committed to a depreciating asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the same time, there is this uh, flexibility that in case, you know, God forbid, uh, you need to take a pay cut because times are tough these days, right? Yeah. Uh, for business owners, what if you can't meet the business volumes or the sales target or revenue that you have projected? then you have the flexibility to either downsize your car if you need to, or to actually cancel your subscription as well. Because uh, there could be months that, you know, income is probably not going to be as uh, predictable as it used to be in the past. So we're seeing this uh, new trend coming up where people want that flexibility and they want to, to they want access to the car, at least the exploratory, to mm -hmm. be as tall as possible. So can you show me a car online with clearer pictures? Can you show, make the whole process of selection, even seeing the car uh, as contactless as possible? Can I just pay for it with my credit card? Like I used to buy airplane tickets. And that is the experience that we are, we are going after. So, so these customers are already mobile savvy, mm -hmm. but their own private space. They don't want to share it if the money is not too far off from taking a grab. I see. So... Uh just imagine a, because there are so many different uh, consumers out there, there are certain consumers who are more concerned about the, the safety aspects of the car. There are others who are more concerned about, you know, whether the, the car looks pretty, you know, the color and the design. Then of course there are all those that are, you know, that looking at the engines and then all those, you know, little specs uh, of, 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 of that particular model. Now you, you are saying that for Caro, we can cater to all kinds of consumers, uh, you know, when it comes to sort of the preference they have uh, when, when they are trying to buy a car. Caro can adapt all of these user preferences when they choose and select the car. Is that the world that uh, Caro is trying to build? Yes. So we are we are building a world where customers can explore a car digitally end-to-end -end as much as possible. They, mm -hmm. If 
buy financing insurance, everything is digital end to end. If they want to view the car, they can do it contactless, humanless, uh, end to end again. And when it comes to preference of cars, so we have everything from your bread and butter cars to uh, SUVs, which are uh, slightly bigger, or even MPVs, which are seven seater cars. Of course, we don't do supercars like a Ferrari and you know, uh, uh, Lamborghinis. That is not the market that we are after. But I just want to touch on the interesting point that you mentioned, which is some people go after the specification, some people go after right. the pretty. Actually, because of COVID, we are interest, increasingly seeing a trend that people want bread and butter cars. So cars that are not too expensive, uh, the cars that are in good quality, preferably used cars, actually, if they want to buy a car. They would rather have a used car than a new car because it's more economical. And they look for assurance. So if, if you sell me a car that has gone through a certain uh, inspection check report mm -hmm. that you show to me, then I'm more assured that, okay, this car is a good quality versus, uh, you know, somebody just trying to sell me something, say, hey, don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, we got it checked. So they look for these assurances, black and white. And if you can provide it online, even better. So that is the world that, that is sort of shaping for automotive now. Right. Okay. This is actually a very cool concept because I think when we talk about mobility, people, I mean, usually just associate with, uh, you know, the, the super big, names right uh, uh especially in the shared mobility space uh, the uber and the grab uh, and I, and we can clearly see that you know caro is doing something different not for shared mobility but about car ownership and the whole suite of services that's surrounding uh this this idea of car ownership now uh caro is today as of today five years old and yes. starting from nobody to a series b startup i believe that must have been a huge roller coaster ride for for everybody, especially a, a senior leader like yourself in the startup. So, um, okay, because you you do oversee the the marketing efforts of of Caro, and in Southeast Asia, in, and of course in Singapore. So, how do do you go about uh, building up this new brand image for Caro, and what is the market entry strategy that you have for Caro? Okay, so the market entry, as as the second part of the question first, because mm -hmm. that the market entry strategy is quite simple, right? We go after the population size and mm -hmm. also the readiness. So that's why if you look at Singapore is, of course, where we started off. So it's a given. We are present here. Uh, then we moved into Indonesia, huge, in fact, the biggest population in Southeast Asia, almost 270 million. So Indonesia then Thailand, and then uh, it was the last uh, was Malaysia. So. Mm -hmm. So we expand based on uh, population size and market readiness as far as the adoptability of smartphone is concerned and how uh, savvy they are in browsing, say, cars online, how much are they using apps right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's pretty much how we've navigated. Now, to answer your second question, Rai, which is the, the brand strategy. So the brand strategy is, is interesting because we are... Uh, Singapore-based company, but as a as a CMO, I will tell you this. Of course, it's important to have one strong brand identity across all entities, right? Mm -hmm. But I've come to, and I've worked in big banks before. So I worked in HSBC, I worked at Aviva, and I've seen how how much brands used to be tightly controlled uh, across markets. But for a company like ours, which is a startup, we have to be more agile. So. I would actually say if we tighten too much the control, you actually strangle your local people and their creativity. So you have to find a very fine balance where you give them the broader narrative that what do you want the customers to think, feel, do when they see your ad? And mm -hmm. that should change regardless of if I'm seeing an ad in Thai, if I'm seeing an ad in Bahasa Indonesia or in Bahasa right. Malaysia or in English. So the think, feel, do shouldn't change. The brand colors shouldn't change. The certain elements uh, shouldn't change. But on writing the copy, you have to give them a bit of leeway. On choosing talent, the pose, you have to give them a bit of leeway. The tonality also, you have to give them a bit of leeway. Because what, what, what I've learned is what works in Singapore does not work in Indonesia. What mm -hmm. works in Indonesia does never works. Like, you know, we have a mascot. It's a rabbit. It's a very cute rabbit. We can't use that rabbit in Indonesia, but it's heavily used in Thailand. So, so, what, so the long story short is when it comes to branding strategy for a startup, 
the CMO mm -hmm. the, has to be agile and also empower the local countries with a bit of freedom to drive the brand. I see. So um, just let me dive a little bit deeper on that. So you mentioned about this balance between, you know, um, having a sort of overall comprehensive brand image, as you mentioned, that the color, the feel, as well yeah. as giving your teams a little bit more autonomy in deciding the the way they want to go about uh, in, in putting uh, that messaging forward. Now, um, just to... Uh, Maybe, I'm not sure if you have an example to share of a, a latest campaign. So how did you actually um, sort of manage that uh, with your teams? If you can share a concrete example of a, a, a recent campaign. Okay, sure. Let me see. Um, I can share something that we, that I'm in the midst of working on. So, so Carol say in Singapore, when it comes to people who want to buy a car from us, okay, so we are deviating mm -hmm. Netflix from cars because that product only exists in Singapore. It is not available in other markets. So think of it as you want to buy a used car from Cairo. Now, the way it is positioned in Singapore is we are the better place to buy. Why is it better? Oh, because there is a 150-point check inspection done. There's a 30-day uh, wear and tear guarantee, which we are the only ones providing in Singapore. Oh, you can also buy it online, and you can test drive for three days. Okay, So it's called the better place to buy cars. Now, if I were to take this and I was to bring it to Indonesia. Now, marketing is very different there. If you look at the way uh, marketing happens, there, it's very emotional. Mm -hmm. in comparison, it, is, it is quite, uh, it is snappy at the same time, but it is short and it is very loud. The colors are very, very vibrant. So I can't take what works in Singapore over there. So now we're looking at what is, what is the emotional sort of take for someone in Indonesia? So, so one of the, the ideas that was shared with me, maybe I can just read it out here because I have it in front of me right now. It could be, uh, don't dream it, drive it. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, would, nice one. Yeah. Would, would this work in Singapore? Mm, maybe not. I think Singapore people are slightly more practical. They want to know, because cars are so expensive, right? They want to know why is it a better place? Why should I choose Caro over the rest? But if I say, oh, no, don't dream and drive it, this would work in Indonesia. It won't work here. And Thailand is going to be totally different with a rabbit mascot. Probably drive. <laughs> so the execution has to be different. But at the same time, the overarching message, and like I said, the thing for you do for the brand identity has to be the same. Mm -hmm. You have It's art and science. you gotta, you got to go hand in hand. Does yeah. that help, for example? It it's, it's very useful. So um, just a little bit about the, the social media exposure, right? Uh, do you yeah. see that uh, similar across countries in Southeast Asia? That means uh, are, are the users more predominantly, for example, on Facebook or Instagram? Uh, does that, is that different uh, across different countries? Yeah, it is different. So in Singapore, we do see uh, Facebook performs quite well. Uh, I mean, Google, okay, let's just say Google is given a cross market. Let's talk about social media. So Facebook does quite well. Uh, but in Indonesia, Instagram is huge. And also in Indonesia, YouTube is huge. So we have to always cater uh, and tweak our marketing spend and also the creatives that we produce according to the platform that we're going in. And within the same platform, there are several different types of ad uh, types that are available. Is it, uh, say, like Stories? Stories does very well, actually, in Indonesia, IG Stories. Mm. Uh, so... So this is what we're seeing. And if you look at say, Thailand, Thailand, again, Facebook does very well. But then they also have Line. So we also advertise in Line uh, in Thailand. Uh, so and in, my, and in Malaysia, we try TikTok. Uh, initially, it was like, wow, it did well. And then suddenly just crashed. <laughs> so that was a learning for us. I haven't tried TikTok in other markets yet. Cool. OK, uh, just let me do a little pause here and do a bit more uh, to talk about a little bit more about feel. So if you guys are enjoying this live stream, please feel free to sign up for our free membership uh, in the link below. And as a member, you have access to all our exclusive offers, collaboration opportunities and complimentary business advice. So welcome back guys. Now we let's move on to the second segment of our discussion today, which is about female leadership. Uh, and uh, Manisha has already touched a little bit about that uh, at the beginning with uh, Ifan. Uh, but okay, so let's uh, 
now shift gears to talk about uh, women in leadership. So, uh, Manisha, I just saw on your LinkedIn, right? Recently, you were uh, invited to share uh, a little bit of your thoughts on this idea of networking, online and offline. So, were there any useful tips uh, that you got out of uh, the session and you find it extremely useful? Please, please share with us. There were several, actually, but I'll focus on the ones that I think are easier to do because mm -hmm. not everybody is comfortable with networking. And uh, when, when I spoke to the ladies, uh, the female employees at Netflix, they're at different levels. And I think it won't be fair to say, oh, you just do this and you'll be fine. Because what if you're not even at that level? It's like playing game, right? You're not at level three. Ask you to mm -hmm. play level three. So, so one of the, the tips that I would say has, has worked well for me is when you think when I think of networking right some people like to network upwards which means you go and find the CEO of some some big shot and uh, uh, you know they would go and do go and stop them online find everything about them prepare like this one page or killer report set up a breakfast with them and then tell them hey you know your business you have to do this this is better I mean that's not me I think it's very forced, but some people it's fine. And I'm not here to judge. It works for you. Great. But the way I do it is I actually network from ground up. What that means is uh, whenever I get an opportunity to mm -hmm. share about uh, anything, you know, it could be, it could be about Cairo, it could be female leadership. It could be about uh, anything. Actually, I usually, if I'm available, I will raise my hand. And I started doing this about, uh, I would say almost, Three years here, let me see. Seven, seven years ago, I started doing this. And it's because every small opportunity is actually an opportunity to learn. Mm. And the smaller the platform for me to network, the lower the risk. So even if so, so when you get an opportunity to network, right? Don't say no. First thing first, don't say no. You say yes, even though it's, it's scaring you on the inside, you say yes, and then you just deal with it. So that's not, that's number one, okay? Okay. And so that's what. Two is when it happens, you show up. So that's what I would do. I would show up. And uh, back then we used to have events and I would wear the nicest clothes. I would make sure that I'm well prepared uh, just for certain things that I would like to talk about if I meet somebody, uh, you know, interesting who's networking. So you show up and you put your best foot forward. I have been, a, uh, honestly, I've been on certain events where when I saw like the profile of people like, huh, like that only. Yeah. And then I over prepare, but it's okay. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so the point here is the smallest uh, yes that you say today will bring you to a bigger yes next time. So always start small up because it gives you more time to practice. Okay? And when you go there, you show up. When you show up, if you get, so I used to be, uh, I used to judge a lot of marketing awards. Mm -hmm. and and, uh, uh, you know, as a judge, you are given two minutes on stage to go and give an award. So I would tell myself, Manisha, you have those two minutes of stage. You better make it, girl. And whatever speech they give you, you smile, you shine bright, and you, you do justice to the winners who, who are winning that award. So that people remember, okay, this judge was slightly different. She really took interest. And... Mm -hmm. uh, she was genuinely happy. So for me, every small that little bit of exposure that you get is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you in a way that people remember you. Okay? Uh, fourth is uh, if you go in a large room, right, mm. with a lot of people, I mean, the past used to happen, uh, don't always gravitate to people that you know. You consciously mm -hmm. go to people you don't know. Even if it's one, it's okay. You start with one, you make them your friend, and then you hang out with them and you go and explore the others. So that tip has worked well. And now back to the virtual world, right? So nowadays uh, there's a lot of like, oh, can we have a virtual coffee? Uh, can we just catch up for like 10, 15 minutes? Uh, so what I've learned is if you, get a, if you get invited to a networking event or even an event like this, when you say, all right, thank you, bye, don't just say bye, all right? Leave your contact details behind. Leave your email behind, your name, your email, your LinkedIn profile, and say, hey, guys, if anybody wants to catch up with me, uh, you know, this is where you do that. Virtual event, if you have a question, ask the question, because most people don't ask. And if you're asking a good question, people will remember you for that question. Mm -hmm. Do you know 
got, uh, I, want, I wanted to, so I'm also a part-time lecturer. And the reason that I got the lecturership is because six years ago, I asked a question in front of 300 people, which is very controversial. But I, because I asked, they remembered. And when I wanted to apply for that, that part-time role, and they remembered that. I think she knows what she's talking about. So you never know what can lead to something. So these are some of the practical tips that have helped me. Uh, I hope it helps you guys too. You always start round up. Don't wait for the big, big thing to happen. Very useful tips. Uh, tips. So let me just uh, summarize what uh, Manisha said. I'm still ardently <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> First of all, uh, tip number one, uh, don't say no. So to every small opportunity, try to take it on. Uh, it will reward you somehow in, in the future. Number two, when it happens, always show up. Uh, number three, small exposure. Every small exposure is an opportunity. And uh, number four, okay, so these are the, so number four is uh, do not gravitate. So when you're in a big room, do not gravitate towards people you are known. So try to, try to uh, you know, try to try to get to meet the, the strangers first. So this is for offline. Now for online, uh, Manisha should suggest that uh, you should leave your email, contact details, not just hi, hi bye, leave your email and contact details behind. And uh, you will never know that, uh, you know, and, and number, sorry, and the final one is to ask questions. When you ask a great question, people will remember who you are. So I really love those tips, Manisha. I have two questions uh, based on the tips that you've shared. Okay, the first one is for uh, the offline networking session. So hmm. I, I do also notice based on my personal experience that, uh, you know, for, for ladies like us, we, we, we are... We can be more creative with, with our, you know, dress codes, right? So yeah. um, I have noticed uh, uh, individuals who actually, uh, I would say, I wouldn't say take advantage, but really use the, uh, the idea of dress code to their strength. So, yes. for example, yes. they, they dress in a very bright color or mm -hmm. uh, they, they bring a very nice uh, bright color bag or something. So, so yeah. then, you know, as, as this individual goes around the room uh, to network, uh, you know, on top of remembering the person by name, uh, it also creates a very nice visual for uh, the, the, the new context to remember this was, oh, this was the lady who carried that bright bag or, or who yes. wore that bright dress. Would you, would this be a, a tip that you think would be useful? For Definitely. Definitely. See, especially like for me, right, when I attend events uh, uh, for Caro, I make it a point to either wear the orange t-shirt with a big car in the center, or like yesterday, I had two events. So I wore a white t-shirt, but I wore a black jacket with a caro badge, uh, a magnet over here. So when people take my picture or when we take pictures together, uh, whatever picture that you take will always have the badge there, or at least the branding is there. And that goes a long way because mm -hmm. it's you alone that is in that place with all these awesome people, it's also your brand. So I'm sharing this more for female entrepreneurs who also want to get their brand out there. Don't be afraid to to show, to wear your brand, and if it's a loud color, that's great. And uh, back to your point, if it's a bag, a handbag that's there, of course, it's a great talking point. For me, it's actually my hair. So even if I wear my mask, people can recognize you because of my hair. And then one thing I get asked is, "Oh, oh, did you color your hair?" And I tell them, no, this is just natural gray. I'm just graying because I'm very stressed. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you're right. And that is what people remember is, uh, oh, you know, the, the lady with the short hair, but she has silver hair. So, yeah, please, ladies, go ahead. Uh, you know, wear, use the colors to your advantage. Create your own talking points. Create your own things that people will remember about you. Uh, we can do so much with that. Be bold. I love that idea. Okay, I think it's time for myself to update my wardrobe. It took me yeah. a while to find a, a flowery top like this. Um, it's time to okay. update my wardrobe to, to all the bright colors. Okay, now yeah. the second question I have uh, is uh, has to do with the online networking aspect. So typically, at a, uh, if you think about an online conference, right, uh, at the main virtual hall, there mm -hmm. is a big chat chat. Uh, big chat room for, for people to, to post messages and introduce themselves. Um, yes. I believe that is a no-brainer for for, uh, for us to, you know, introduce who we are and leave our contact details there. Um, 
my question for you would be, um, in order to be remembered, because imagine that there will be hundreds of people doing the same, right? Uh, in mm -hmm. order for us to be remembered, would you recommend a, uh, would you advise uh, to take on a more, a uh, sort of lively or uh, a loud approach, you know, to, to uh, enthusiastic approach in coming to uh, introduce ourselves to make it more sort of easily remembered? Or would you suggest, you know, just go for the professional and then see uh, whether people uh, see your message? Which approach would you recommend? I always prefer the unconventional method. So one mm -hmm. thing I is my background. So remember earlier I was asking you, how come I can't, can't change my background? I have a beautiful Zoom background that is white and there's a white BMW because I, I love cars and I'm in the trade of cars, right? And then there's a little car road. There's a better place to buy cars. It's very cool. So make use of that background to show your personality. Mm -hmm. So if someone asks me about that, I will tell them, oh yeah, I am driving a BM right now and I just love the brand. I prefer it over Mercedes and they can ask me what. So that becomes something that they remember. So use the background to show your personality. Second is if, again, I would come back to asking questions. And if there's things that you don't agree with the herd, right? It's okay not to have a herd mentality. And often, oftentimes I've noticed that people who display they don't have herd mentality are the ones that people remember. Now they can choose to agree or disagree with you. That's not the point. It's fine if you don't agree with me, right? But you will remember me. So love me or hate me, you can't ignore me. Nice one. Nice <laughs> one. Okay, Manisha, we have a lot of questions coming in. So okay. I'm sorry, guys, if I cannot cover everything, we'll try our best to cover everything, okay? Now, uh, the f uh, let's do, let me see, let me just categorize them. Okay, the first one um, has to do, uh, let's come back to Carl, has to do with... Uh, Carol and the and the the, the transport uh, uh, business. Now, uh, the question is this: the talk of the town for the future of transport is driverless cars. How mm -hmm. do you think Carol is positioned to embrace this future? We are probably the best positions because you must understand we are not car manufacturers. We are a tech company that makes cars accessible to people. Uh, through their phones or just by data, we tell them how good a condition a car is in. So if there is a driverless car, it is given that the OEMs or you could say the, the car manufacturers, they've already done their part in making sure that the cars don't have a collision. Uh, if it's driverless, you know, they know uh, how the instructions to be given either through a smartphone. So all that is actually taken care of by the manufacturer. So we don't really bother why um, a BM comes with a certain car I play, whereas you know a Mercedes comes with something else. That's fine. It actually doesn't doesn't concern us. Uh, in fact, the moment cars do go driverless, we expect more of car uh, manufacturers to turn to want to partner with people like us, so mm -hmm. that we can be able and we can digitize them better and faster because they are still sort of stuck. A lot of their operations and the way they go to market is still still very much stuck in the past. Okay. Now, uh, another question um, that is, uh, this is a question from uh, uh, Zhi Yang. Uh, Zhi Yang asks, there are similar companies uh, in the market like yourself. So how does Caro differentiate yourself from the rest of the brands out there? Okay. So there are other market, other companies like us, say in the US, so there's Carvana, right? There's Room. Mm. You look at Southeast Asia, actually there's there's nobody like us. Like absolutely, there's, there's really nobody. There's nobody who is who is uh, spread out in four countries, who is uh, in the entire ecosystem of cars, which is not just what we call B two C, which means we sell cars or we or we uh, subscribe cars to end customers, but we also have a huge B two B part of business where we uh, we actually have enable trade between two used car dealers. And then there's a financing wrapper that goes on, which we also provide them financing with. We also do insurance uh, for them. So for our scale and our width of business, there's actually no other player in Southeast Asia right now. Are there, what about uh, the complementary ones? Do you see those at your, as your competitors or more um, like partners? More like partners, right? So if you look at Singapore, there is a, some people say, hey, are you guys similar to say SG Carmart? And then we right. say, no, 
It's actually quite different because SG Karma is a, is a platform, it's like e-classified where you put up your car for sale. So if you are selling your car uh, or you want to buy the car from SG Karma, you're not buying it from SG Karma. You're buying it from a dealer who put up his car for sale on SG Karma. So it's like OLX, uh, in, say in Indonesia, or uh, it's like maybe like Craigslist probably uh, in the US, but it's, it's, you're not dealing directly with that. Whereas for us, the cars that you're subscribing from us primarily are either our own or they come from partners who are exclusive to us. So it works very differently. Not anybody can just go and put up uh, cars uh, for sale of a subscription with us. So it's different. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Lady in Red. She, uh, I, I believe it's she, I, because of Lady in Red. Uh, Lady in Red asked uh, that uh, our company is expanding in Southeast Asia as well. Okay. Currently working on our brand presence online in Southeast Asian countries. Do you have any advice for engaging the local community? Mm, this is a good question, actually. Local community, right, is... Uh, it's always good to know where your audience is hanging out. So when you say local community, uh, let's say, okay, I'll just come up with a hypothesis, okay? So let's say your company is putting up this, uh, since we're talking about uh, female entrepreneurs, right? Let's say you're putting up this program that, uh, that wants more younger girls to take up courses in STEM. Okay, and that is that is what you're after. Now you want to expand. You've already done a good job in Singapore. You want to expand in, say, Indonesia and Malaysia. What do you do? What you do is you go and look for existing communities who already are in touch with your target audience. So I know there is a lean-in circle. So that's more for the senior, uh, also slightly more experienced women. And there's also girls in tech, uh, which mm -hmm. is a community. What they do, and then there's she loves data. Right, that's another community. So there are actually a lot of these existing women communities that you can reach out to, you partner with them, you tap on their, their database and their expertise to because it's a win-win, isn't it? They want to empower more women to take up STEM courses and they want more women to embrace, say, uh, data, but it's not happening. And here you are building courses that are meant for women and for younger girls, so they embrace mm -hmm. You see more women coming up in the tech space. So it's a perfect sort of uh, partnership. And then you work with them and then you work and you and then you create your campaign from ground from there to ground down. Right? And then you win these early adopters first and you learn from this experience because probably know what works in Singapore probably is not going to work in Indonesia. Who knows, right? But mm. partnered, you are making an inexpensive mistake which you can learn from, and then you make some tweaks, and then you relaunch it. And then once you've sort of fine-tuned fine it, to, okay, this makes, means, makes sense, then you add another partner. Then you add another partner. And once you have scale only, then you say, okay, I think I'm gonna advertise it. Or if you don't wanna advertise, you bring it to schools, you bring it to uh, universities, see if they are keen. So, so for me, again, it goes back to the networking example that I gave you earlier. Yeah. Well, Ground up is the best way because you make inexpensive mistakes and you go up this way. Nice. Manisha, one final question before, before we close. If you can just give one advice, I will not, give, not, I will not ask for three or ten, just one advice <laughs> to the female entrepreneurs out there uh, who are probably facing, because of COVID, all kinds of challenges, uh, financing, finding the right talent, everything. If there's one advice you can give them, what would it be? Now, one advice would be believe in yourself. Really believe in yourself. Because what you see in yourself is not what others can see. Okay? So it's just a matter of time. Things are going to get better. Believe in yourself and, uh, and, and don't stop. Really don't stop. Thank you, Manisha. You're so happy. We have come to... I'm not so happy with the end of the session. <laughs> I hope we can stay longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you everyone for tuning in today. It was so glad to have Manisha with us. Uh, it was a very engaging as well as enriching session for all of us. We have all learned something new. Now, to see uh, our calendar of events for future live streams or to submit a request for a live stream, please uh, check out our website at fw.community slash askfewanything or find it in the description below. 
uh, if you enjoyed this episode uh, and would like to have more business insights from the experts in the field, and of course, stay up to date with all the, the latest uh, business developments, please sign up for our free membership. Uh, also in the link below, as our member, you will be able to connect with other members and industry leaders, as well as enjoy exclusive offers and complimentary business advice. Manisha, thank you once again. And thank you, everybody. See you guys next time.